And before I introduce our speaker who doesn't need an introduction, uh, let me mention two things. First of all, there is a small scale reception upstairs, right above us, after the uh, seminar. So that's different from what we used to have before, which was before the seminar. It's after the seminar. I think it's a good opportunity to ask all the questions you wanted to ask during the talk but didn't have a chance to. The second thing is just to um, let you know about the next seminar. The next seminar will be two weeks from now. And today we'll hear about potassium channels. And two weeks from now, we'll hear about sodium channels. So you'll have two weeks to switch from potassium to sodium. Anyway, our speaker today really doesn't need an introduction, not here, but um, Jim Nirbun, Professor Nirbun, is a professor, the endowed uh, alumni professor in the Department of Developmental Biology, which used to be pharmacology, right? Until not too long ago. Uh, Jean received her PhD from Georgetown in um, organic chemistry. And then uh, spent a few years at Caltech doing a postdoc in the Department of Biology there. Then came to Washington University. <coughs> and as, uh, as recent as about a year ago or so, two years, how long have you been the director of the cardiovascular? One year and three months. One year and three months. <laughs> That's the official number. And she's not counting. She's been the, <laughs> she's been the director of the um, Cardiovascular Research Center. And she'll tell us about, I mean, Jen has received many, many awards. She was the chair of the ESTA study section um, and um, many other contributions on editorial boards. Um, she studied the complex structures of uh, ion channel proteins. That is not just the ion channel protein, but its complex uh, situation within the membrane and regulatory interactions. And she'll tell us today about the diversity of uh, potassium channels in the heart. Thank you for Thank you. accepting my invitation. Thank you. So, um, as Yoram said, for quite some time, my lab has been interested in studying potassium channels. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you why we chose potassium channels to focus on, and then sort of the various kinds of approaches we've taken, always with an eye towards the physiology. So, as you'll see, and, and Yoram alluded to, over the years we've realized that these, these channels actually function in these macromolecular protein complexes. And one of the sort of challenges, I think, both in um, normal physiology, but also in the pathophysiology of the heart, is to understand these mechanisms at, at a detailed level, because I think that they're actually multi-level and, and rather complex. So maybe I'll just turn down these slides. Maybe that's enough, actually. Too much down there. We get everybody in the dark. I think it's too hard. Right, right. People get used to it. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I, I think it's okay. Students yeah. are so funny. Um, so, so please um, <laughs> feel free to interrupt me um, at any point. And uh, the way I've sort of structured my talk, you can stop at any time, and I won't make you stay past. 530 since Europe has your freshman time. One paid political announcement, or unpaid I should say, is that to remind everybody that Cardiovascular Research Day is November 7th. It will take place in the Farrell Teaching and Learning Center. There will be a seminar from Helen Hobbs from UT Southwestern and um, posters by graduate students, uh, clinical fellows, postdoctoral fellows, and there will be monetary prizes for the best posters, so please, everybody, send in your abstracts today. So, um, as everybody here certainly knows, one of the intriguing things about, uh, about the heart is that 
it functions as an electromechanical pump. And so the electricity and the electrical flow in the heart is critical to maintaining normal pump function. And this cartoon actually is just an illustration of what the electrical properties of different cells and different regions of the heart look like. And this is one of the things that sort of got us uh, really intrigued a long time ago in what underlies this, um, this diversity. And um, I have these organized in, in, the, in the spread of the normal propagation of activity through the heart. But I think what you'll see with the exception of nodal tissue is that the big difference between the extrapotential waveforms and the atrial myocardium versus the ventricular myocardium is primarily in the repolarization phase. So the upstrokes of the action potentials are rather similar, and it's the, the uh, repolarization phases that are different. And so at the time, we and many other people postulated that these differences must reflect differences either in the types of repolarizing potential channels that are expressed, or simply differences in the expression of the same kinds of channels. And so over the years, a, a rather large number of laboratories have have contributed to figuring out what the ionic currents and underlying cardiac action potentials are. And I think um, this, this little illustration here is intended to, to point out to you that um, there are sodium channels that underlie the depolarization, calcium channels that really underlie the, primarily the plateau phase and are the triggers for excitation, contraction, and coupling. But the diversity really lies in the potassium channels that underlie the resting potential, the early repolarization phase that contribute to maintaining the plateau, and then the later phase of repolarization. And these um, little uh, cartoons underneath are actually what the, the predictions of mathematical models of the various currents in their waveforms as a function of um, the time course of the action. So then the sort of working hypothesis is that the voltage-gated potassium channels um, are the primary determinants of cardiac repolarization. And as you all know, over the years, we've identified, we, many laboratories, have contributed to identifying the molecular correlates of these channels, at least from the perspective of the poor forming subunits. So what do I mean by that? So in voltage clamp recordings, it's possible, and it's been possible for a long time, to distinguish voltage-gated potassium channel currents. And so these are currents that are recorded under conditions that all other ionic flow is blocked. So sodium currents are blocked, calcium currents are blocked. There's no chloride currents because of the way the uh, solutions inside and outside the cell have been set up. These are recordings, as I will talk more about later, from, a, from mouse ventricular myocytes, so cells from the right ventricle, left ventricular apex, and from the interventricular septum. And I think what you'll immediately notice is that these waveforms are actually rather similar. And in a lot of experiments, and I'm not going to um, go into detail, we've distinguished three components of these currents based on biophysical properties. A transient outward current, which we call a fast transient current, a delayed rectifier current, and then a steady state or not inactivated current for people. And then similar analysis um, in cells from the, the apex of the left ventricle and from the interventricular septum, and we've since gone on and done base and different regions of the right ventricle. And, and basically, all the biophysical data suggest that the components of the current are identical in different cell types. The one unique current that's only expressed in the septum, at least in the mouse, is another component of transient current, which we call ITO slow, and that's a reflection of the fact that its biophysical properties are different. It inactivates a little bit more slowly than ITO fast, and it recovers from inactivation much more slowly, which, which, which results in a, in a big functional difference in these currents. So what, um, so then the, the sort of driving hypothesis then is that if these channels are the primary determinants of repolarization, the changes in the expression or the properties of these channels will alter the waveforms of action potentials. And if for the currents that are differentially distributed, for example, the ITO fast, which I showed you here, is a much higher density in right ventricle than it is in the apex than it is in the septum, and it's also a difference if you can look at the apex to the base. So changes in the properties of any of these currents, particularly if they're differentially distributed, are potentially um, arrhythmogenic, generating arrhythmogenic substrates. 
And although everything I'm going to talk about today is, has been in the mouse, these currents, if I showed you today, and actually I'm giving a talk in the Center for Cardiovascular Research in a couple of weeks where I'm going to talk also about some human data, and, and it really, the, the properties of the currents are indistinguishable. If we sat a mouse and a rat and a, a canine and, you know, there are subtle differences, but for the most part, they are, the currents are remarkably similar. And the other striking thing is that the cells in the heart look almost identical. So there's more cells in a human heart, but each individual heart cell looks morphologically indistinguishable. If you came into the lab and looked at a dissociated myocytes from a, a dog or a human or a mouse, you would be able to tell the difference. Okay. Yeah. So the mouse heart goes at 600. My heart right now is going 60, I'm hoping. And so, so you say they're indistinguishable in, in, in spite of the fact that the heart rates are so drastically different? Yeah, so the currents are the same and the, the channels are the same, but how they add up, well, yeah. So I'm going to get to that, but the bottom line is that the relative densities of the channels, when I showed you the records from the human heart, I suggested that the densities of the channels or the properties of the channels could be different and that could give you different wave flows. The waveform of mouse action potential, I'm going to show it to you in a few minutes, is much, much briefer. The duration is much briefer than in the game. So it's on the order of 40 milliseconds as opposed to several hundred milliseconds. And the big difference at is actually the relative proportions of some of these currents I mentioned last And one of the things that, that um, we and other people have been doing recently is trying to make mathematical models of these currents and this is a lot of work um, done by Scott Maris and Stephen Springer in my lab, where they've generated mathematical models and then introduced those two cells during recording, simultaneous with the, with the current clip recording, and ask the question, if they introduce the current mathematically, how does that affect the action? And I think that's potentially a really powerful way to ask what's the functional effects of changes, either in density or so, Jean, yeah. is there a difference in current clamp action potentials in the septum that's, that reflects the difference in the IK slow? Yes, there is actually. So, um, there's a, it's a, the, the action potentials are slightly different in their shapes, but they're also longer. So, at 50 and 90% repolarization is substantially. Because in those cells, as you saw, the densities of the ITO fast is lower, and in addition, you have that other current. And so they have also rate-dependent differences. Okay, so um, what do we know or what do we think about um, regulation of potassium channels? So during normal cardiac development, these channels um, change their expression levels. I'm not really going to talk much about that. But I think more interesting for many people here is that in a variety of myocardial disease states, and these are obviously acquired cardiac disease states, cardiac hypertrophy, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and diabetes and metabolic syndrome, it's very clear that when one, either in an animal model or in cells from human heart, that the big differences in the properties can be tightly correlated with differences in the potassium channel. And so, obviously, then, the, again, the working hypothesis is that the normal regulation of these channels is important in the generation of normal rhythms, and that when they are remodeled, if you will, and this is a term that I think um, tip often has a pathophysiological consequence, but I'll show you an example where of a physiological remodeling process where there are big changes, and I guess you call development a physiological remodeling process, but there are examples where changes are, are, are necessary to maintain normal cardiac function. So then what are the mechanisms um, that underlie this kind of remodeling? So obviously at the transcript level, the post-transcriptional and translational level, and then post-translational level. And if you remember anything that I say today, what I want you to remember is that all of these mechanisms are critical to determine the functional cell surface expression of these channels and actually all kinds of other channels as well. And not just in the heart, in, in any cell type. So if you measure a change in current, 
it's not sufficient then to look at transcript levels and say transcript levels do or do not change, and therefore that's what underlies the remodeling process. It's really necessary to look at every one of these levels, and I'm going to show you examples of each of them. <clears throat> so, um, as I said before, we've characterized the biophysical properties of all these currents. I'm going to focus in on the transient outward current because that's the one we focus more on than the others, but I'll be happy to tell you molecular details that we know at this point in time about the molecular identities of these various channels as well as the things that regulate them. So, as everybody here knows, um, particularly people who've um, listened to the talks from the Shuey lab, know that voltage-gated potassium channels are have a, um, are tetrameric structures. They're comprised of four pore-forming subunits that have this sort of membrane topology. Six transmembrane-spanning domains, a highly charged region called the S4 region, which is the primary determinant of the voltage-dependent gating process, and then a region between the fifth and sixth transmembrane domains that's uh, involved in forming the potassium-selected core. And interestingly, when these channels were first cloned in the late 1980s, this kind of structure was postulated based on the sequence homology to voltage-gated sodium channels and calcium channels, which had already been identified biochemically and shown to, to basically look like four of these um, six transmembrane subunit structures linked together um, to, to give you basically a huge protein of 24 uh, transmembrane spanning. So the first potassium channel was cloned from the Shaker, Locus, and Drosophila, and when um, RNA was made from that clone DNA, injected into oocytes, it gave rise to voltage-gated potassium channel currents. So again, these are currents only dependent on changes in membrane voltage and the paradigm is illustrated here. The membrane potential is held at a hyperpolarizing level and then depolarized to multiple um, levels. And the amplitude of the current increases as a function of the size of the depolarizing step. So the smallest currents are the smallest steps, the largest currents are the largest steps. And as you see here, these currents activate and inactivate rapidly. And subsequent to the identification of, uh, of the shaker locus, three other families of multiplicated channel subunits were cloned, uh, also from Drosophila, and they were called Shab, the Shaw, and Shal. And it's a little known inside bit of information, but they were all cloned here at WashU in Larry Salkoff's lab. And those initials have to do with the people in his lab who did the cloning. So Shaw, for example, is Aguan Wei, and Shab is uh, Alice Butler. I think Shal must be Alice Butler the second time. Maybe that's her middle initial. I'm not sure. So in Drosophila, there is only one member of each of these families. So the KV1 family is Shaker. So K, potassium channel B, voltage-gated subfamily 1, KB3 is Shaw, KB2 is uh, Shab, and KB4 is Shab. But the probes, the sequences of the Drosophila pore-forming subunits, allowed people then to screen mammalian libraries, and a huge number of families of channel subunits were cloned in this sort of phylogenetic tree shown here. The, one of the big differences between vertebrates and invertebrates is that within each of these families there are multiple members. So the KB1 family has nine members, the KB2 only has two members, three has four, and four has three different members. And each of these other uh, subfamilies, so the one you've heard a lot about in, from Jean Min's lab is the KBLPT. There's several members of that family, one of them which is predominant in the heart, but the others are pro predominant in the nervous, throughout the nervous system. So, Here's now a potential, there's a huge level of diversity now just generated by all those different alpha subunits. One of the things that was, was clear from heterologous expression systems is that if you put together two members of the same family, they would form functional channels. So I told you there's multiple members of the KB1 family. If you co-express 1.1 and 1.2 together in an HEK cell or an oocyte, whatever, you get channels um, that are functional. And oftentimes their properties are different than those of the homomeric channels formed by either subunit or one. So that's potentially a way to get diversity. 
<coughs> there's very few examples in real cells where people have figured out the molecular composition of the alpha subunits at that level. There's also a good bit of alternative splicing in each of these alpha subunits, which in Drosophila has been shown to give profound differences in voltage-dependent properties and kinetic properties. And again, it's something that in mammals, although we now know from both cloning data and more recently from sequencing data, that there are expression of different variants of some of these uh, alpha subunits. So if you start to do the, the computational analysis and ask how many different kinds of channels could there be, there actually could be a lot of different potassium channels. And so, as I'm going to show you, um, we have shown that the KB4 subfamily of alpha subunits encode the past transient current. And in addition to the pore forming subunits, there's a host of different accessory subunits that have been identified. <coughs> the first of these were the MinK protein subfamily. They were named this, um, the MinK meant minimal potassium channel subunit. And it was called MinK because when it was first cloned and expressed in oocytes by itself, gave rise to a voltage sensitive potassium channel current. And that set off a flurry of activity saying, this just breaks all the rules, right? It doesn't look anything like this. How could you possibly get a channel out of something like that? And there were a number of laboratories who went to work trying to figure out the stoichiometry of those channels, and they came up with six subunits, or 12 subunits, or 27 subunits. And anyway, finally, somebody figured out the right answer. And that was that in the oocyte, there was a pore forming alpha subunit that this subunit actually combines with, and that's what they were measuring when they were doing experiments. And so this points to a real risky thing about using heterologous expression systems to define the functional properties of, um, if your goal is to define the functional properties of native channels. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the role of these two accessory subunits because they were both um, identified as accessory subunits of KB4 subfamily of pore forming The potassium channel interacting proteins are the K chips. There's four members of that family. And the good news is in the heart, it looks like the only one that's expressed at any appreciable level is the K chip 2. The other one that's of interest is the DPX or DPP6 was the first one cloned. These are a, these are members of a um, dipeptidyl aminotransferase family but the protein itself has no enzymatic activity that's ever been able to be measured. So this is a transmembrane protein. These are cytosolic proteins. One of the interesting things about these proteins is that they have multiple EF calcium binding domains. And there's recently, um, there, there were several suggestions when they were first uh, described, saying that those uh, EF hand domains were not influencing the calcium sensitivity of the channels encoded by KB4 when the K-chips are present. But there's now two very, very compelling papers in uh, granule cells in the cerebellum that show that the K-chip couples an interaction between voltage-gated calcium channels and voltage-gated KB4-encoded potassium channels. So now we have a potential of regulation or an interaction of one subunit between two different types of channels and then an intracellular mechanism <clears throat> so this is my uh, full disclosure so slide to tell you that we work on the mouse <laughs> primarily, or everything that I'm going to talk about today is in the mouse. And there'll be a quiz at the end if anybody knows what this is from. We'll see who are the real music aficionados. Okay, so Shondo's question. Uh, it's important uh, to recognize that the actual potential waveform in mouse particular myocytes really don't look anything like the action potential of waveforms in human particular myocytes. So not only can you see that there's a dramatic difference in shape, but notice that the time scale here is very, very different. So one of the big differences is that in, in adult mouse particular myocytes, they have a very high density of fast transient outward current, and that contributes to this rapid Repolarization, but that's not the only thing as um, as we and other people have shown. 
all of these other potassium channels that are expressed are contributing to this rapid repolarization. It's really hard to knock all of them out and see what happens because when you start to knock out some of these <coughs> potassium channels, they also affect the resting membrane potential. <coughs> and it becomes very difficult. You have two confounding effects, right? You've got the membrane potential and the loss of the channel. So this is another case where the dynamic clamp approach is, is potentially very powerful to allow you to computationally add or take away an individual current while you're recording an action potential. And it's been shown in David Christini's lab a couple of years ago that if you do this in a mouse, they published a paper called Anthropomorphizing the Mouse Particular Action Potential, they could actually make it look a lot like uh, human but I think that just tells you that it's a balance of all these curves. Okay, so um, as I told you, we've shown that the ITO channels are encoded by the KB4 alpha subunit family, and I'll just give you results published data, so I'll just give you a summary of how we did that. So initially, uh, when we started out, we used a, a strategy that we called a dominant negative strategy. And that was basically, we made a mutation in the pore forming subunit, in this case, KB4.2. And the idea was to make the minimal um, mutational change that didn't change the structure of the protein. So we took advantage of a strategy that was developed by Pancho Bethania and his colleagues when they wanted to study gating currents in the anticipated potassium channels. They produced, a, they made a single mutation in the pore region and show that when they did that, they made a fun, non-functional channel. <clears throat> and then we showed, or we found, that if you take that mutant subunit and express it with any other KB4 pore-forming alpha subunit, you basically get no functional occurrence. So we used this strategy, um, widespread in the mouse, using uh, of all the various KB families, KB4, and then we did one, three, two, et cetera, to basically um, ask the question, are any of these currents uh, exclusively encoded by members of the KB uh, KB4, KB2, KB1 family? So I think, I don't have to sort of make an argument, I think you can see in the presence of the KB4 tube dominant negative, we basically eliminate the fast component of the transient current, and we eliminate it throughout the ventricles, through the right ventricle, the apex, and in the interventricular cell. And then we went on to, to delete the individual subunits, and what we found is that deleting KB4.2, but not 4.3, and I'm not going to show you those data, but when we delete, when we delete 4.2, we, we get exactly the same sort of effect. So that doesn't say that these native channels are homomeric KB4 channels, but it does say that KB4.2 is the critical pore forming subunit in the generation of these channels. We know that the KB4.3 protein is there, and we know that the KB4-3 protein immunoprecipitates with uh, KB4-3. So um, we thought initially that probably what was happening, that the reason that the 4.2 knockout was giving us loss of the ITO current was that the KB4-3 protein was probably gone. So these are just Western blots, examples of uh, wild type and knockouts. 4.2 knockouts, and this is just cumulative data from lots of experiments shown on the bottom. And I think in these representative ones, you can see that the difference in 4.3 expression is um, is negligible. But strikingly, this accessory protein that I pointed out before, KCHIP2, in the 4.2 knockouts is basically undetectable. So the accessory subunit, when you eliminate the pore forming subunit, is um, is not is gone. So, just you want to probably is ask. The RNA level, or is that the? <laughs> so that's at the protein level, right? Because those are Western blocks. But then we looked at the RNA level, and we did it with multiple sets of different primers. The bottom line is all of these data show that the KCHIP2 level is unchanged. This is KCHIP2. This is KCHIP2 and KCHIP2. So there's no change, there's no detectable change here in message, there's only a change in So then, what happens when you when you eliminate the K-chip? So that was the next experiment we did, generated a K-chip 2 knockout, 
and strikingly, the KH2 knockout, the, the, uh, the fast transient current, is eliminated. And if you compare those records to the knockout, I think you'll agree that they're indistinguishable. So this says that the accessory protein is absolutely critical to the formation of the, of the native channel. So I guess it's not an accessory subunit anymore. It's a critical, um, it's a critical regulatory protein. So how does that work? So these data just show that, um, interestingly enough, in the case of 2 knockout, this is KB42 protein level. In the 4-2 knockout, it's obviously gone. And in the KCHIP2 knockout, the KB4 protein is also gone. So that basically is the same result as what we had for the KCHIP with the KB4-2 knockout. So this says that these two proteins, when you eliminate one or the other, it results in a loss of the, of the reciprocal protein. So these are the protein in the, in the the, the lysate or in the membrane? Yeah, this, these ones are lysates, but it doesn't matter, actually. It doesn't matter. So that's actually a good question. And I'm not going to show you the data today, but we've actually done experiments where we've reintroduced KCHIP2 to see whether we could rescue. I think I don't know. I don't think I'll show you the data. But similar to the KCHIP2 story, the KB42 message is not affected by the loss of the KCHIP2. Um, transfer. So again, it's suggesting that everything is regulated at the protein level, not at the transfer. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, Dan, Simon, uh, Dan Miner's lab um, crystallized one of the KB4 subunits, KB4.3, with one of the K-chip subunits, K-chip 1. And they, they showed this very interesting relationship between the KCHIP2 protein and the very end terminus of the KB4-2 protein. And these data clearly suggest that the critical domain for interaction between the KB4 and the KCHIP is, is the end terminal domain of the protein. And so if you express uh, wild type KB42 by itself or with KCHIP, you see a huge, this is now in heterologous cells, you see a huge increase in the amplitude of the current. And if we ask the question, so this is actually that structure, but now mapped onto there being four alpha subunits and four KCHIPs that make up a native channel. It, it doesn't have to be the case, but, uh, but uh, we, that's what we think is going on, that they're each one of the and terminal domains is bound to the kitchen. And so if we take away that domain, we just generate a mutant subunit that doesn't have that domain, what we find is that there's no longer any regulation by kitchen. So the KB4 delta 40 mutant, uh, so that's the whole end terminus, plus, and plus kitchen and minus kitchen, uh, the current densities are in. See, does that the uh, deletion actually uh, allow the channel to express uh, more? Uh, or, in other words, does that the... Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you the protein suppress? data. It's actually interesting. It does, the enteromus does several things, but I'll show you the protein okay. data. I think it will answer it for you. So here is the Western blot data, just a representative example of the wild-type protein minus and plus k -chip and then the mutant protein minus the plus k -chip. So the mutant looks like it's expressed at about the same level as the, um, as the wild type protein. And if you do cell surface labeling and ask whether the same amount is on the surface, the answer is yes, it looks like the same amount is on the surface. And so what we think is going on, because as you obviously noticed, the current amplitudes here are large. Uh, the, if I put these right next to the wild type, this looks very much like K-chip. So it suggests that the end terminus with K-chip attached functions like an inhibitory domain of the channel, and when you remove it, you get more current. So then we sort of decided to, to look at the functional effects of, of making uh, various size deletions in this end terminus to see whether we could uh, test the model predicted by the crystal structure about the role of the first sort of 25 amino acids in that end terminus, which in the crystal structure are predicted to be in that pocket. Um, and so what we did basically was we 
removed the first 10 uh, residues, the first 20, and the first 30. And then we did uh, electrophysiology, and we did biochemistry, and here's the wild type data that you've seen before. The end to the 10 amino acid deletion, you still get robust enhancement of total protein expression by the, um, by the co-expression of, of cake chip. When you get rid of 20, the first 20 amino acids, it kind of drops, and by the time you get out to 30, there's basically no modulation. And if you sort of look at what that looks like in the, in the crystal structure, if you focus over here, if what it looks like when you take away the first 10, 20, 30, and 40, and when you do, when you do that, you basically have two effectively functionally separate proteins that are no longer interacting. But this also, I think, points out one of the real um, sort of risks in interpreting, interpreting data from heterologous expression because even though I told you in myocytes, in, in the intact heart, when we got rid of K-chip, we lost the KB42 protein and we lost the current, it's very well established, and I showed you data, that 4.2 by itself in HEK cells gives you robust potassium. So it sort of suggests that when you do these overexpression experiments, you can basically swamp the quality control mechanism in the cell and you can get functional channels expressed. And then the reciprocal experiment here, um, these are the, basically the same experiments, but instead of probing for KB42 protein, we probed for KCHIP2. And you can see with the uh, full length uh, KB4, there's uh, robust, upregulation of K-chip, it's similar with the 10 deletion, and then as you chop up the N-terminus of the KB4, you basically lose the K-chip protein. So again, I think these data support the in vivo data that the two proteins interact, and they probably interact early on in the biosynthetic pathway, form a complex, and that complex is critical um, to making functional native channels. So I'll just mention about another uh, accessory protein that I talked about very briefly, and that's members of the DPP family. And one of the striking things that um, we noticed was that if you express the DPP subunits by themselves, and the DPP, as I said, are transmembrane proteins with a very large um, extracellular domain. If you express these by themselves in ATK cells, this is the YFP tag protein. I think you can see that the um, that the uh, the YFP or the DPP6 is localized on the plasma membrane. So this is in the absence of KB4. So this, these results suggest that DPP6 by itself traffics to the membrane, and that's comparison to the K chip, which is obviously cytosolic and uh, is not at the membrane in the, in the absence of DPP6. So. We did a similar kind of biochemical experiment where we co-expressed the KB4 plus K-chip, I mean plus DPP6, and then measured total KB4 protein and uh, total DPP6 protein, surface KB4 and surface DPP6. And the bottom line is that the DPP6 um, and the K-chip and, and the KB4, sorry, don't give any co-stabilization. The KB4 protein levels the same in the absence and in the presence of DPP6, and the same is true with the DPP6. Interestingly, what the DPP6 does is it localizes the KB4 protein at the plasma membrane. So this suggests that the DPP protein goes to the membrane by itself, independent of the KB4, and that it interacts at the cell surface. So does DPP6 play a role in the generation of the KB4 currents in the mouse heart? Um, we looked actually in a uh, ventricle, uh, in a DPP6 knockout mouse, not generated by us, but, but generated um, by Bernardo Rudy, Rudy's lab at NYU, and we didn't find any functional effect on the currents. There's a report from Stan Mattel's lab at Montreal that um, in canine and human Purkinje cells, there's a novel kind of ITO that's made up of DPP6 and KB4 subunits, plus without any K-chip, but with a member of the K-chip family, that NCS protein that was on that earlier slide. 
the member of the family, it also has the FKN binding domain, but they claim that there's no kinship to in there. So we um, were fortunate um, with Stacy Rentschler's help to get a hold. I don't know if here, but to get a hold of a uh, <laughs> to get a hold of a um, a mouse that's expressing GFP in conduction system cells, so we could actually isolate for Kenji cells. And Stephen Springer has looked uh, pretty exhaustively at those. We don't even find any IT on the mouse, so um, that's something very different about. It. The human, obviously, and canine, and those Oh yeah. Have what? you tried to um, target the KD42 to the membrane using like some other tag that would just get it to the membrane to see whether it alone would be functional? Yeah. No, we haven't done that. But but um, so yeah, I'm sure it would be just based on the overexpression experiment because we know that if we drive the system, we do get current. Yeah. So you know, I, I should I should point out that. The, all the alpha subunits were cloned and characterized in expression systems long before any of the accessory subunits were. Um, yeah. So in this case, it's, I, I think one could definitely do that. And one of the things um, that we have been trying to do for a long time is put fluorescent tags in the alpha subunits themselves, and then to be able to look at them trafficking in myocytes. And we've just had a lot of trouble actually getting expression in. in what we would call wild type expression with this, you know, we did it with transgenics, now we've done it with knock in. It just hasn't worked that well. I don't know whether the tags interfere with things or not. Speaking of V6, do you see any preferential localization of the particular disease? That's a really good question. And unfortunately, the antibodies to the DPP6 just aren't very good. And so we've got so much background in the heart. But I think that's an important question that would be really important. It would be certainly in the human. I think so. Absolutely. Okay, so the bottom line is that it, um, association of 4-2 and DPP6 does not stabilize the person. So I just want to do one quick aside um, to tell you about, so this is kind of like figuring out um, channel composition like one protein at a time. And one of the things that became really clear is that, as I've told you now, we've got DPP6. There's a paper from Jeff Abbott's lab that shows that the deletion of MERP1 affects these same currents, the ITO currents and the delayed rectifier. We have data showing that one of these KD beta subunits does the same thing. So what we decided to do was to take a proteomics approach and, and actually immunoprecipitate the complexes from native tissue and then to analyze all the components. And um, we did this using two different approaches. One of them was to actually immunoprecipitate, and we used KB42 as the um, precipitating antibody and put this on magnetic beads and then immunoprecipitated the complexes, ran them out on gels, and then cut out the various bands and then analyzed them by mass spectrometry. And then we did sort of a, a, a grosser level of experiment where we took the whole complex and rather than running it out on a gel and analyzing individual components, we just analyzed this entire thing. And I'll just show you what the results of this look like. So, um, as I said, we used 4-2 as a precipitating antibody, and we identified lots of peptides um, associated with KB4-2. We identified the other members of the family, 4-1, 4-3. And this is, these are heart samples, so it's a little bit simpler. I mean, these are brain samples, a little bit simpler in the heart. But K-chip accessory subunits, DPP accessory subunits. So this sort of says that the proteins that people have said should be accessory subunits are really there. This is using the in-gel targeted approach. And then we did a similar thing using the solution approach and then um, using a 2D column basically which gave us better, better punch, better separation. We got a whole lot of additional proteins, one of which was the KV beta subunit and then, much to our surprise, we got a whole host of other KD4 associated proteins, one of which uh, is a sodium channel beta 1 and beta 2 subunit. So, this is the thing that we decided to pursue because obviously, this it would be sort of heretical to think that a sodium channel beta subunit regulates potassium channel. This sort of says, I mean, the sort of conventional view of uh, sort of the 
dogma of Hodgkin Huxley, right, is that sodium channels and potassium channels operate independently, but here we have a subunit that interacts with both. Could it possibly be coupling these channels? And so we just did the experiment in, again in heterologous expression systems where we took 4 2 and expressed it with the NAV beta, compared those results to the K chip 2, and then uh, co expressed both things together. And then the cumulative data are shown over here, and I think you will agree that there's a big enhancement of total current density uh, when we have the, the NAV data. So. And I'm not going to show you the data because to date all of our experiments analyzing the functional effect of the sodium channel beta subunit have been in neurons. We haven't yet done this in the heart. But we're predicting that the beta subunit will be uh, affecting the KB4 encoded IT. So what does the channel then look like? So it has, this is now a cutout cross section of the channel. I'm only showing you two alpha subunits, two K chips. Uh, one DPP6, we don't know the stoichiometry, so I'm not trying to imply that we know that this is one to two. We do know that the DPP subunits, when crystallized alone, crystallizes dimers. It doesn't mean that there's not four of them, but it could be certainly four or more. Or more. Uh, the MinK uh, MERP subunits, again, are transmembrane proteins, as I said. We've got the KB beta subunits here, and the most recent addition. Um, to this is the sodium channel beta subunit. Actually, there's even one more addition to this, the semaphorins that bind also to the extracellular domain of the KB4 subunits. So now we have the big question is, are all of the channels functioning in these complexes? And are these, um, and are these static complexes or dynamic complexes? So I didn't describe the data to you, but there's a lot of evidence that these beta subunits regulate other kinds of potassium channels. There's certainly lots of data that the MinK Merck uh, accessory subunits regulate lots of other channels. And obviously there's considerable evidence that the sodium channel beta subunits regulate sodium channels. So are these all, is every ITO channel have this composition or are they different in just different cell types? The data from Stan Natel's lab that I alluded to certainly argues that in the Pinchy cells, in the dog, and in the human, the, the ITO has a different composition than in the ventricle. So I think that's potentially a really important question to sort through. And we are hoping to do that. We are trying to do that in human by immunoprecipitating these complexes for different regions. Um, I just, let me just skip this. I'll just tell you that we've shown previously in pathological hypertrophy that you get um, a big effect on potassium channel currents and other currents as well. Um, and that this regulation um, is probably primarily, this is just in the hypertrophy part. There's a big effort of regulation of total message and total protein in these hearts, but there's really no um, effect on the KB4 subunits. So the change in the density that I just showed you, it seems to be totally a result of just the fact that the cells get bigger and there's not enough regulation of the transcripts. I see the time, and so I'm just going to skip the next two, which is basically physiological hypertrophy. But if anybody wants to come to the CCR in a couple of weeks, you can hear a big story about remodeling and hypertrophy. So I just want to end with, with this idea because we talked about um, uh, sort of these co-regulatory proteins. But we've also looked in, in, a, in a case of uh, a mouse model actually developed by Mark Anderson's lab in which, so as you know, upregulation of CAM kinase 2 is, has been linked to heart failure. And Mark Anderson's lab made a mouse in which they made a, took a peptide inhibitor of CAM kinase, expressed it in the heart in the heart of the mouse, and they also had a control peptide. And we looked at, um, and we are looking, continuing to look, at the potassium currents in, in, those, in that model, and this is um, potassium currents recorded from the matricular cell in the inhibitor mice, and this is the control peptide. And I think what you can see here is that there is a significantly different, significantly different 
amplitude or density of the potassium current in the inhibitor mice. And this difference uh, is not related to a difference in transcript levels. So this is transcript levels for all the various channel subunits, but for the KCNV2 and 3 and KCHIP2, there's no uh, significant increase in any of those subunits. And the same thing when we look at Western blocks, we look at 4.2, 4.3, K-chip, and then we just look at another one for control. There's no obvious uh, change in protein level. So we think that this uh, reflects, this is just quantitated from many different experiments. And so what we think that this reflects is uh, post-translational modifications of the KD4 protein or one of the accessory proteins. And this is just a mass spec of, um, KB42 protein, and Eric Johnson, who's not here because he just left town to get married. Seems like a lot of nerve to me when he could be in the lab doing experiments. But um, we've identified a number of peptides in the CNN termini, and we're interested in uh, cam kinase um, phosphorylation sites. And again, Eric is doing this both in the mouse and in the human part. And we've also identified poten potential. Uh, Camp kinase phosphorylation sites both on K-chip and on the KB beta subunit, and here in the blue is the, um, the KB4 alpha subunit. So, so that's potentially another way to regulate both the functional channel properties and their expression is by phosphorylation, dephosphorylation of the individual subunits and, and maybe the accessory subunits, and that will influence in turn not only the channel properties, but perhaps the interaction between these different proteins as a result of this So, so that's uh, the last thing I want to say is that in addition to all the things I told you, that it's very clear in the heart, and it's also clear in other systems, that not only are the all of these channels interacting with all these accessory regulatory proteins, but they're also interacting with the sort of cytoskeletal architecture of the cells, and that's probably influencing. Um, channel expression. I think for sodium channels, there's a lot of good data for that, and for gap junction channels as well. Potassium channels is not as much data, but I'm sure it's going to turn out to be. So I think with that, I will acknowledge all the people who did the work. Uh, Nick Fosher, uh, who's a student in my lab. Uh, Wei Dong was a postdoc. Eric is uh, now a postdoc in the lab. Uh, Celine, many of you knew, who um, was a postdoc and is now running her own lab in France. Rico uh, was a postdoc and is now uh, back in Japan. Stephen is presently in the lab. David is presently in the lab. And many of you knew KC also, who was a graduate student in the lab. And he just returned to Taiwan and literally is just setting up his lab uh, in the, as we speak. And Hao Dong Xu um, was a postdoc. He started a lot of the early potassium channel work. So I always have to acknowledge him because he was really a pioneer. And he's presently a faculty member at UCLA. And Rick uh, Wilson is uh, the, the mouse guru in our lab, and Rebecca is all things wonderful in the lab. She takes care of all, all kinds of things. And my many outstanding collaborators, Mark, I mentioned, Patrick J. and Julie McMullen um, were involved in the um, physiological hypertrophy studies, which I really didn't mention, but as I said, I will next week or two weeks when I speak the CCR. And Reed Townsend, um, it, as many of you know, runs the proteomics core here, and um, he's been critical to our efforts to do proteomics on these membrane protein complexes. Jim Trimmer is a long-term collaborator who's made an, an enormous number of very, very useful and validated antibodies for many of these protein subunits. And Catherine uh, is also a long-term collaborator. Um, that we, we've studied a lot of these mouse processes for many years, and uh, and finally, I thank you. Nobody recognizes? No, nobody recognizes. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Any questions or comments? John. John. I was surprised that you don't get any change in the other currents when you get rid of the KV 4.2. Is, is that the case with all of them, or are there some that are tied together where, where they feel yeah. this other yeah. expression. So we do get a change, and I skipped over it. And so 
when we get rid of the ITO fast, so either with the dominant negative or with the knockout, there's upregulation in all the regions of the ventricle of the slow transient current. And that is encoded by a different family. It's a KD 1.4 subunit. So, and that's probably the same in human, actually. And then when we, when we get rid of both of them, there is no further modulation. So there's definitely something, and it's functional, because you get the same effect whether you do the dominant negative or the knockout, and also with the K-chip tool. So it really is, it's sort of that, it is, I hate to say, feeding back between what's at the membrane and, and how the cell is working. I think, I think so, but we haven't figured out a way to figure that out. Yeah. You mentioned that you're going to um, do proteomics <coughs> with the cells. I was just wondering how you're going to isolate enough. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, unfortunately we're really doing it in the human, we're just taking different parts of the venue. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we can like do Like a gross that. dissection? Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't think we can do that, actually. It would be great if we could. I mean, if somebody came up with a cell surface market, you could sort them and do it that way. But I, I really, I don't, I don't think we can. I've tried to do that many times. You have? By sorting? Not in human, but, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I just, yeah, I think, um, so if you if you would look at the papers from Stan, Stan Attell, they, they show you protein, and they say that it's for Kenji specifically. But without, you know, without, it's hard to know, you know, it's, um, Have you ever tried to use, uh, like, the first of 40 amino acids of K4.2 and try to see if it can induce the expression of HF? Yeah, that's a great idea. No, we haven't done that. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. That could be a job. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. No, we haven't done that. So the original identification of the K chips was with the N terminus in a yeast two hybrid screen using the N terminus as the gate. So I think probably we could yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Jean, for the testing of your um, channel complex, the different proteins that uh, form it, have you have you tried um, knocking some of those down with SIRNA or or some antibodies, for example, and see what happens to the current? Yeah, so we don't have antibodies that give knockdown, but that would be a great idea if we had functional antibodies. But we are doing exactly what you suggest. And we want to do it in human because um, in a human, there's a lot of interesting reports in the literature, for example, particularly some of these KCNE2, KCNE3, and also the sodium channel beta subunits that are linked to Brugada. And when the KCNE subunit mutations were co-expressed with different, like KCNQ1 and, and ERG and all these other potassium, they didn't give any effect, but when they're co-expressed with KB43, they do. And so we just thought it would be best to go, you know, and so I think in the mouse, we kind of know all the players now, um, but I think it would be definitely nice to do that. So we now have, SIRNAs that work against all of them. We have a way to deliver them uh, with adenovirus and we literally just make them. Yeah. Actually, we have the first two, I believe. If Eric would come back from the honeymoon, <laughs> we'd be really making great progress. Yeah. Just, just, people are making humanized mice with them and so on. Is there, any, is there a rationale to make a humanized mouse with in the heart or aspects of the heart, or is it, are they so just different in terms of their size and length and so on? And so on? Yeah, I, I think that would be a great idea, actually. I mean, I, I, I don't know really how to do it. Um, it is definitely the case that you can get rid of a lot of these potassium currents and mice are just fine. So I don't know, and part of that's upregulation, and maybe it's partly to just find the right combination. But you'd have to slow down the heart rate too, right? Not just manipulate it with them. Yeah, I think it's. But you know, there are there are a few examples of sodium channel mouse models that have been you know sort of informative. Over the years. So the other thing related is that you know in the large marrows in the human, ITO really participates in rate dependent adaptation of the action because it through the property of it's slow recovery from inactivation. 
Do you know? Have you, have you, have you looked into it as to how that function of inactivation is modulated by all these interactions or any of them? Yeah, so we have actually. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. So two things that are apparent. One is that if you co-express a lot of these things in heterologous cells, you get effects on total protein, cell surface proteins, typically inactivation and recovery from inactivation. And then the question is, do, is that really what's going on in native cells? And so all I can tell you is that, for example, in the K-chip knockout, we reintroduce KB42, where there's no K-chip, and we get a current that is indistinguishable from the wild type. So I don't know what that means. And also, I would just add to that, um, that all of our data in human now is looking as though there really is in healthy, non-failing human myocytes, I hate to get into that debate, but in non-failing myocytes, there is no slope of IPO. Well, you know, one, one thing you could try, which is to find out what this idea is to see what this current does in the guinea pig. It seems like the guinea pig lives without IPO, and leaves like this have to be ever grafted. Yeah, so we're doing it in the pig. So it turns yeah, out that the pig, pig looks just like the guinea pig. There is no ITO. Right. And so we're doing it by adding it with a virus and by adding it with a dynamic clamp. That'd be interesting to see. Uh, it's that. very interesting. And there, with the dynamic clamp, the beauty is we can change the properties of it as well. And one of the functions yeah. that is suggested is sort of uh, synchronizing calcium release across the wall. Absolutely. That'd Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think that the power of the the dynamic clamp with the cell physiology with the molecular manipulations is really huge, actually. Um, and it's 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 working pretty well. And now, with people's help, like John, an and, uh, undergraduate who's really good at you know programming, which I'm I'm not, and, um, is is helping us to change the models so we can really. Like the so that's the system we're using. So we set up the RTXI, Scott set up actually the RTXI <coughs> uh, dynamic flip system. And they're they're using it. So Scott is doing it on IPS cells, even on pigment mind sites and pig mind sites. So, yeah. Yeah. Fibroblasts. Yes. Do they play a role in this potassium business, channel business? I mean, depending on who's cartoon I read, some people say, well, the fibroblasts are the most popular cell in the heart. There's more fibroblasts than myocytes. Well, Socially the myocytes popular or? <laughs> numeric. <laughs> numeric. Okay. And, yeah. and then some people say, oh, they're electrically active. That's what I'm saying, oh, they're not electrically active. And then some people say, oh, there's many more of them in a ventricle than in the atrium and all that stuff. So I'm just asking, if in, in characterizing passing channels, if there's data, for example, on fibroblasts active. So there is data on fibroblasts, and so I think in terms of numbers of cells, you're absolutely right. In terms of mass, the myocytes are by far the biggest mm -hmm. mass. So, um, but yes, there's a lot of evidence, and, and there's a, a link in atrial fibrillation between not these channels. Well, there are a different family of channels that are permeable to multiple ions, including calcium ions, called the trip channels. And they are expressed in fibroblasts and have been linked to proliferation of fibroblasts. And um, I think that's a big open question. I, I think it's a very interesting question. I think, you know, the mantra of, that all all cells are excitable it seems to be inex inescapable. They don't all make action potentials, but they all use channels for all kinds of things. And, and I think fibroblasts are among those. So I think it'd be a very interesting. Maybe Catherine has something to say. She knows much more. Well, at least they're lessons. coupled, and so people that step up. So they're electrically coupled to electrically myocytes? Electrically coupled. Well, mm. you know, not, not so they affect the, you know, membrane potential or anything, but, you know, it, Stefan Rohr has shown that you can get electrotonic coupling and that, you know, they're, they're coupled by gap junctions. And so there could be a component of, uh, altering, altering excitability or something like that, you know, because the conduction velocity, if you go across a synthetic strand of myocytes, <coughs> is slowed, but it still moves through what one would consider non-myocytic, replaced with fibroblasts. So. Yeah, and, and I think um, you're right. 
your friend even, um, who's doing uh, regeneration stem cells and, and, and the fellow also at, um, I think it was Skin? Gepstein, yes. And um, I forget who he collaborates with in California, but, but they basically have, have actually tried fibroblasts to couple them to myocytes as, as a as a therapeutic. They're trying this at the tech end, too. At the tech end, right. Yeah. I don't know how successful it is. I'm not an expert. It's successful, by any but it's not where the digital recapitulates what's really happening yeah. in people. Greg Morley does a lot of that, too. Uh -huh. And he yeah. shows that they're coupled. With and they get so they coupled, yes, but yeah. you don't know yeah. right. quantitatively if the electrical loading is the same. Right. Yeah, right, because you've got this big impedance mismatch, right? Yeah. 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 I think it's an interesting question. Sandor, I think the fact that some people say this and seem to have that's the science is objective, but scientists are not. Very rabbinical comment. <laughs> John. That's true. So those extracellular <coughs> domains on some of the accessory subunits, like the sodium channel beta, and you had another one that had really big extracellular. Yeah, the JTP6. Yeah, do you have any evidence that extracellular factors can control chemical kinetics through those? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so for the, so we don't, but I, I think it's a it's potentially a very interesting. Uh, we were recently involved in a collaboration with Mike Ackerman from the Mayo Clinic, and they. <coughs> identified a mutation in a Brigada family and subsequently in three other Brigada families in 704 and 3A. That's an extracellular protein. It binds uh, in, in a place that sort of, you would predict it to dock right adjacent. It, it binds in a toxin binding domain in this channel actually. And semaphorins have been linked in the nervous system anyway to formation of synapses and so who knows what it's doing, but I think those are very interesting questions. It also has a lot of developmental effects. Absolutely, too. yeah, that's right. It's very well known about like uh, many developmental uh, defects, for example, even formation of the pulmonary veins and the output. That's back. right, absolutely, absolutely. So, so I think that you know it's it's a big open question, and, and certainly Stacy could speak to this much better than I, but. But all, a lot of these things, you know, what they're doing in development and what they're doing in the adults may not be the same thing, and how these things go up and down, and blah, 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 blah. But I, yeah, but I, I do think, I think one has to keep all that in mind. It's one of the reasons why I, I really do think it's good to do things in heterologous cells, but you have to go pretty quickly to a real cell, a real cell. It's still an isolated cell, so it's well, not a part of it. Why, why is ITO made to appear in the world? Exactly right. And that's yeah. true in every species that's been looked at. Anyway. Any other questions? If not, as I said, there are refreshments upstairs. Thank, Thank you. you, Jim. Thank you guys have some stuff.